This ESPN podcast is brought to you by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit GEICO.com. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. The BS Report. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Welcome to the BS Report. Taping this on a Thursday morning, a little bit rainy here in Southern California. I don't know when it's running. Uh, a bucket list guest, Larry David. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us. This is great. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. Um, I wonder if, if this room could actually be in, in a house. If somebody A man cave? Yeah, like a man cave kind of thing. I, I feel like you're impressed by it, but you're just kind of looking around no, and I do. checking I out re- the posters. I, re- I really like it. You know why? Because I can't... I can't decorate anything. I have no, I have no photos. I have no record of my life at all. Seriously? Yeah, hardly anything. Like, What's your office look like? Well, people always send me books. Yeah, I don't know why, but I get they send me books. So you just put them <laughs> in a bookshelf. So I just put them in a bookshelf. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you won like a lot of Emmys and things like that. So where do those go? They're in my basement. In your basement? Yeah. Are they displayed or are they in boxes? No, no, they're in a room in the basement. <laughs> what? And, and then my kids brought a, brought some up to my bedroom. Yeah. You know? So, so now there's a few in my bedroom because I haven't taken them down yet. Just like on a dresser or something. Yeah. And I, and I yeah the kids put them there, and I, I haven't taken I haven't taken them down yet, but um, I'm waiting to see if I if I can lure. Somebody back there, if I can lure a woman back there, how she might react to that. And if it's to multiple words. <laughs> yeah. And if, if if it's favorable, maybe I'll leave them. You know, I don't even know but how if, many. But if she goes, oh, what are you doing with those words out? <laughs> how many do you even know how many you've won? I mean, because you had two different runs. Yeah. Um, well, you know, Seinfeld didn't win many Emmys at all. I mean, we won a lot of awards, but we only won for best show once. That's amazing. Yeah. And we were nominated every year, but we only won it once. Frazier won every year. And um, that doesn't make a ton of sense. Frazier was a good show. Yeah. It probably should have been a little more even. I thought so. Mm. Did you go, or were you one of those people that just stopped going after a while? Yeah, I, start, I started off going, and then all of a sudden, you know, we, we're not winning this thing. Why am, right. why am I going? And that's usually when you win, when you're not there. Yeah, no, but we didn't. We won for the contest huh? that, that year, and um, that's the only time we won, and I was there for that. Hmm. I know people probably tell you this, but I was in on the ground floor on that show, the Seinfeld Chronicles. Oh, you were? Yeah. Well, I had a Seinfeld background because I was a huge Letterman guy. And young, young Seinfeld was like one of his best guests. Yes. And yes. that was how I knew him. And I, I, I made my parents take him to go see him in comedy. So I felt like invested in him. I wanted him to succeed. And then that show came out. And it was like, whoa, this is cool. Are they going to, they're probably going to cancel this show. That's it's what too I different. Thought. That's what I thought. It's not going to last. I never thought it would last. You thought like it was like going to be like a Viking funeral? Well, first of all, I couldn't imagine myself being involved with anything successful. So, yeah, I thought, uh, no, it's, it's going to be impossible. And, and I was I was kind of doing what I wanted to do. Yeah. And I wasn't getting too much interference. Um, I, I, there, were, there was some, yeah. which, which I resisted. But um, I remember going out to dinner with Jerry and saying... I, this is after we did like four shows. I said, I, I, I can't believe they're letting us do this. You know, And that was a good 25 years ago, right? Yeah. 1989? Yeah, started in 89. Yeah, I was in college. Yeah. So you at that point, you're not thinking, this is going to go on for so long. I'm actually going to leave the show. Oh, God, Because I will no. have done so many of these. I just want no. new challenges in life. No. In fact, when it got picked up for the like second or third season, I remember, I remember crying because I thought... Oh, how, how am I going to continue to do this? Where am I going to get all of the ideas that you need to do a season right. of shows? It's unbelievable how many ideas you have to go through. And they all have to be funny and good. But then you had you had lots of writers. They, that helps. You have writers. Yes, meetings. that helps. People yes. give you ideas. Absolutely. Kernels of ideas. Absolutely. Yeah. I never understood until Curb Your Enthusiasm how much of 
of pieces of George Costanza were, were you. And I, I don't think there would have been no way to understand that because I didn't have a history with you. Mm -hmm. But did you feel like that was like a like a proxy for you in a lot of ways? I'd say semi. Semi-proxy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, semi-proxy. Because eventually then you just had fun with it and curb your enthusiasm when it came on. But yeah, um, it's it, like you never at any point thought I should just play this guy? No. No. I never felt like, oh, I wish I was doing that. First of all, Jason was so amazing. Right. That... There's no way I could have done it better than Jason. He was incredible. Yeah. So it never. And by the way, even if even if they wanted me to do it, I couldn't have done it anyway. There's no way that you can act on that show and also um, kind of run it at the same time. It would have been really hard. So what made you, you know, I, I don't mean to do the mayor and breakdown here. We talked about that earlier. No, no, um, I don't care. But what yeah. made you. So Seinfeld's this. You couldn't have done better with Seinfeld. It finishes. You make more than enough money. You get more than enough accolades, all that stuff. What made you decide to drift back and create this second beast? Because um, most people just like, I'm done. I'm going to live on the beach. I'm going to play golf. Okay. Well, I was going to go back and do, um, do stand-up, which I hadn't done in 10 years. Yep. And so Jeff Garland had an office next to me at uh, Castle Rock, and or he was working with my friend Alan Zoy Bell there on something. Yeah. And so Jeff said to me, what are you going to do next? I said, I, I think maybe I, I, I'm going to try and do some stand-up. And he said, well, you should film it. And I thought, why, why, why should I do it? He said, yeah, I'll direct it. It'll make a, it'll make a really good... HBO special, you going back to stand up after a 10 year absence. Mm. And so I didn't want to do it. And I spoke to my wife about it. And she said, yeah, yeah, you should do that. You should do that. And so I started talking about it with Jeff. I said, well, maybe I'll do it. But what is it? It feels like it's going to be really boring. Um, what? You're going to shoot me on stage? And and what's going to happen off stage? There's nothing interesting off stage that's going to. I'll be in the office writing stand up. Right. You know what? What is there in this documentary other than me being on stage? And I said the only way that I could do something like this is if I made up things to happen to me off stage, and we filmed that as if it were really my life and part of this documentary. Yeah. Then I can make up interesting, funny situations. And so he said, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, that seems, uh, that seems okay. Yeah, do that. I said, okay, I'm going to do that. And then I started writing it, and I thought, and I, and I wrote a part for a manager, and I said, well, why don't you just play the manager, and we'll get somebody else to direct? He said, yeah, okay, let's, let's do that. So, um, and it was just supposed to be a special, a one-time special of me going back to do stand-up after a 10-year absence. I made up all these off-screen scenarios. So it was like a mockumentary, basically. Basically, yeah. And um, during the filming of it, we all kind of sensed that there was a potential series there, as did Chris Albrecht, who was running HBO at the time, and he said something to me. I remember watching it. it. This was like Christopher Guest, like his movies at the time were, you know, had become these huge cult things and the DVDs. Right. And everybody loved those. And right. I remember watching it and thinking like, oh, this is like, this is good. Like this, but I, I never thought it was going to become what it became. I never, I mean, how many episodes do you, you've done like 75, 80, 85, something done like that? 80. Yeah. yeah. And it just blossomed and went in all these different directions. And also like, I, like the, I swear this is a compliment. Your acting got really good on it. Well, like you're not a you never weren't ever acted before. You know what? I I took a um, when I was doing stand up in New York. Yeah. Before Seinfeld, I um, I took an improv class, and I really thought after the class was over, I remember getting a compliment. Of course, I remember every compliment I've ever gotten in my life. You know. <laughs> <laughs> this woman in the class said, you're, you're really good at this. And I said, hey, hey, I'm really good at this. <laughs> right. Yeah, I can do this. Yeah, I can do this. So, and, and I liked it. I enjoyed it. I, I liked improvising. I didn't really like acting so much with a script. That never really appealed to me. Right. Um, I'm sure we'll be getting into that later. But um, so 
I knew that if this was going to be a documentary, that it had to be improvised. This special, that the Curb Your Enthusiasm like a special. A constant ad lib. Const- constantly making it up. Otherwise, it wouldn't seem like a documentary. So yeah. the offstage stuff had to be improvised. Um, and, I, and I liked it. But th- thank you for the, uh, for the acting compliment. That's nice. I'll remember I mean, that one for the rest of my it's life. It's really too. hard. Well, I'm sure you've had a couple actors that you felt like could have hung with the ad-lib stuff and the improv stuff and couldn't totally do it. I mean, you don't have to name names, but yeah, it, no, there must have been a couple of people. Most like, actors, I can't do this. Most actors love doing it. Yeah. Um, but there are some who just can't. The, what they, the, the mistake that most people make is they try to be funny. And the biggest note that I would always give any actor was, don't try to be funny. Just just do what the scene calls for. Right. Or some, one, once you try and inject jokes, then then you're done. Can it go the other way where somebody tries to be too deadpan and then it's just dead? Well, sometimes people try to be too serious and start yeah. crying. And, and I say <laughs> them, the first rule is you cannot, cannot cry <laughs> on this show. You cannot. It's impossible. Yeah, it will not work. How did you figure out what the line was between somebody playing themselves and somebody acting? Like Sherry O'Terry to me is was pretty famous on SNL, but yet played a character on Curb Your Enthusiasm. So is it like a case by case basis? Is there a jury committee? No, I don't know. It's uh, yeah, case by case basis. But Sherry O'Terry was so damn funny in that episode. She was great. That was yeah. one of the one of the. Hall of Famers, I think. Yeah. I loved how you rated our seasons. Uh, I think this was you. I think it probably was me. As if as if it was a pitcher. Oh, yeah. Pitching yeah. season. Pitching yeah, season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'd give like season three. I was 23 and six, you know, with a 2.40 ERA. And then there are other seasons you didn't like, you didn't quite like as much. And I, well, I liked I, every season. Yeah. But it was just, I was I was measuring it as some sort of Doc Gooden, Pedro <laughs> Martinez level. <laughs> I really got a kick out of that. <laughs> oh, that was you. really funny. What was your favorite season? <clears throat> I mean, I'm sure they all blend together a little bit. Well, I love doing the uh, producer season where I got to be, or I got to play on Broadway with, you know, doing yeah, Max yeah. Bialystok and all that. And we filmed at the uh, same theater in New York yeah. where they were doing the show and worked with Mel Brooks. So yeah. that, that was a blast. And, um, and the episodes themselves, I, I enjoyed, you know, working with Schwimmer and Ben Stiller that season as yeah. well. Um, that was probably the most fun for a season, but <clears throat> boy, I, I loved, um, I loved the Seinfeld reunion season. Well, that, I would say that was the riskiest season. Cause if that had gone wrong, it really could have yes. tarnished a bunch of yeah. different things. <laughs> yeah, it could have. That was a tight You're rope. Right. <laughs> that was what? Yeah, it was a tight rope. Yeah. I mean, was. almost like it, it turned out, I think really well. Thanks. But Thanks. It also could have been like, oh, why? Did, and then the way the internet works now, people get so mad and they're so entitled over things they care about and shows yeah. they love and music they love that if you mess with that, they react like you've tried to steal their children. No, I don't know. Don't. Uh, You're not an internet person. No. But um, no, I can't read all that criticism. I would. <laughs> you you, you would, go in the garage. I would kill me. Yeah. Just kill me. Probably a good yeah. idea. I, yeah. I try to avoid as much of it as oh I can. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. It's internet's not always the friendliest place. No, it's, it would frighten me. Well, one thing you should know about the internet is people constantly wonder when your show's coming back. Yeah, no, You've well, kind of left everyone in limbo for a couple of years here. Well, I get that, you know, a lot. Yeah, um, obviously. But, is that the number one question you get? Yes. Yeah, that would be number one. And you don't have an answer? No, I don't. Because I'm still not prepared to say that I'm not doing it again. Nor am I prepared to say that I am. So I don't know. It would be funny if you were an athlete and you just hadn't retired yet, but it was like four years after your last pitch. <laughs> exactly. I, might, yeah. I, I could yeah. be in spring training. I don't know. Yeah, right. Like you're Roger Clemens, basically, without the steroids. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, would, what would be the reason to do another season for you? Just because I love doing it so much and um, it would just be fun. Probably. What would be the reason not to do it? Um that I have other things coming up. Like your play like that we're going to talk about Yeah, later. And, um, you know, sometimes you've seen reunion shows on television when the, <laughs> and the actors look 
so much older than how you remember them right. in the show. And even though you could see that actor doing something else, once you put them back into that same environment with those other people and they've all aged so much, it mm. just looks it looks it looks wrong. It seems wrong. Why are they doing this? Right. You know, so that might be one reason. So you'd rather get out a little bit early than a little bit late. Yeah. I think that's fair. Well, you know, we did eight seasons. Yeah. I mean, it was started in 2000. Yeah. It was, it was on for a lot longer exactly. than people thought. Yeah. So we did eight seasons, uh, which is a lot for a TV show. Yeah. Um, the, the climate's a little different now. I'd be interested to see how, you know, I mean, it's impossible to say because you did it in the moment, but like some of the content pushed the envelope. Some of the jokes pushed the envelope. And now people... As Twitter has become more and more of a force and the internet and people mobilize beyond causes and they get totally, it's become performance art in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. I wonder if people would get bent out of shape by some of the jokes and stuff. Oh. It's just a different, it's, it's a weirdly more sensitive society. Well, like even like the James Earl Ray joke from, what, what was that, like the first or second season? The uh, <laughs> Richard Lewis uh, when what, the, the guy was jogging and he made the inappropriate, you know, oh, he turned into James Earl Ray. Yeah, yeah. Like, even that joke, I wonder like now if people are like, hey, you, you shouldn't bet. You really? know what I mean? I, I don't I, know. It wouldn't, it wouldn't bother me in the least. I, would, I, would, I wouldn't care. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Because I do think, I do worry sometimes with comedy that people, you know, we're, we're hitting some sort of line where if, if people are thinking about comedy all the time and not just doing it, and they're always worried about what the repercussions are going to be. That's not a place I want to be. Yeah. You're not going to know where the lines are unless you're kind of occasionally stumbling over them. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. I would get a lot of, of uh, compliments from conservatives, political conservatives, who really like the show. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because um, I think the humor was somewhat politically in incorrect, which they, right. which they seem to appreciate. Well, you seem like you hit... A couple of people have hit this zone, like Howard Stern's definitely in there, and Charles Barkley, I think you're in there, a couple others, where it's like you, people give you the benefit of the doubt, which is nice. Yeah. I don't know if a lot of people have that. Yeah. Um, that's a compliment. Take I, that one, too. I, I, I you can do. think about that's, that one 20 no, years from that, now. That is a good compliment. Yeah. I, it's nice to be in that zone. <laughs> it's good. I, I wish I was I, in that I zone. I hope it continues. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to be there someday. I, you know what? I think you are in that zone. Oh, maybe, maybe yeah. I am. <laughs> yeah. Suspension uh, aside. Occasional suspension yeah. aside. Right. Yeah. What made you decide to do a play? My, my friend, Lloyd Braun, um, I, I had... I remember going to the theater a few years ago and um, thinking, oh, th it would be pretty c cool to write a play. Mm. If, I could ever have a, if I could ever write a play, that would be great. You know, he hearing those laughs in the theater, that seemed like it could be fun. Right. And, um, but I, I didn't really dwell on it. Then my friend Lloyd Braun's father died, and he started telling me about it. And I, th I thought, Jesus, this sounds like it's a this sounds like a play to me. It was pretty funny, even mm. though somebody died. You know, <laughs> right. it was kind of funny. Um, and so, I just started uh, working on it, and here we are. And Lloyd's one of the producers, actually. And it's producing. Mm. It's it's premiering in February. Yes. Yeah. Give us the details. Well. It's called Fish in the Dark. Yeah, it's called Fish in the Dark. Um, Broadway? I, Broadway. I wasn't, I, I didn't write it to be in it, but it seems like when I write something, there's usually a character who, <laughs> who sounds a lot like me. Right. So um, Scott Rudin, the producer, told me that I have to be in it. And I said, I, I, didn't, I didn't write it to be in it. I don't want to be in it. I just want to stand in the back and watch it. Mm. And then go back to Los Angeles and and go back to my house and and um, my golf, you know. Right. And but he, he said, uh, "Well, have a read through. Well, why don't you just have a read through and do it at the read through and see how see how it feels." So we got some actors together in Los Angeles. Yeah. And we did a read through, and um, it went very well. You got sucked in. And I got sucked in. And I remember Rob Reiner played one of the 
parts in the read through. And he said, oh, you, you got to do this. You got to do this. <laughs> you got to You got to do this. So, so yeah, sucked in. Ex- exactly. So f- early February, Broadway, how big is the theater going to be? Um, I don't know. Probably a thousand or something. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Terrifying. I was going to say it's yeah. a little scary. Yeah. It's really scary. Jesus. Yeah. Really, really scary. I love that you keep challenging yourself, though. I don't. No, that's good. That's yeah. a good quality. Yeah. It's, it might be a good quality for someone else. <laughs> Speaking of uh, of challenging yourself, you've been a Jets fan your whole life. Oh, yes. No, we have to talk about it. Yeah, let's talk about we it. We have to talk about sure, it. Sure, let's. Because you, 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 I mean, we could talk about all the same stuff you talk about in any interview, but, but no, no, I, you don't I, get to talk about sports enough. No, I don't. I would love to talk about it. New York sports fan. Yes. Your teams are the Jets. Who yes. else? The Knicks. The Knicks, the Rangers, and the, and the Yankees. I also— So rough, rough last couple of years. Yes. Yeah, so I'll also root for the Giants and the Mets, but not as much as the Yankees and the Jets. So you, so you support most of the New York teams, but you yes. have your four favorites. Okay. Right. So the Jets. Yeah. Um, I get a lot of emails from Jets fans. Like they've passed some sort of point of hopelessness that like <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. Like this yeah. week, I ha- I know Jet- I have a couple Jets fan buddies too, and they're all convinced they're going to win in Tennessee this week and ruin their chance at the number one pick. This is this is the thing I've never really quite felt like this in my life to want my team t- so desperately to lose. Right. But here's the thing: even if they win. They still might not get the number one because you've got Tampa Bay, yeah, and you've got uh, Tennessee, and um, Oakland and Jacksonville, and Oakland yeah. and Jacksonville. Although Jacksonville, I don't think will draft a quarterback. No. So I think it's coming down to um, Tampa Bay will definitely draft a quarterback. No question. No question. And oh, I think I Oakland, actually think all of those teams will draft a quarterback because Blake Bortles hasn't been lighted up for Jacksonville. Well, I think I don't. I don't think Jacksonville will, and I don't think Oakland will. Just because they're Oakland? Just because they're Oakland. <laughs> okay. Derek Carr seems to be doing okay. It's competent. Yeah. So they have a shot at Mariota or Winston. Yeah. I would, you know, I desperately hope that they don't beat, they're playing Tennessee, right? They're playing Tennessee. Yeah. He's very, very, very not competent. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, like, there's so many Jetsy kind of things going on right now because yeah. you also have Darrell Revis. Who's one of the greatest Jets ever? Has solidified the Pat secondary, right? And you have Sanchez in Philly, yeah, and exactly. That's another thing. My I'm Jets rooting fan. for Sanchez to do well. I You're like rooting him. for Sanchez. I, I want him that's to nice. do well. Sure, why not? He's a, he's a good guy. He, okay, he didn't deserve all that all that grief about the, that butt fumble and all that. I agree. Um, so I'm rooting for him to do well, and uh, I am rooting for the Jets to lose with a fervor. With a fervor. A fervor, yes. It's fun to root against your team sometimes. It is. As long as it's for the right yeah. reason. Um, but with the Jets' luck, they will finish 2-14, and 14 and they'll be behind. Because if, because if the draft were held today, yeah. they would be like number four or five. They wouldn't get the quarterback. How, how's that for bad luck? The Jets, it seems I, like— I mean, that's what's going to happen. Don't you see it? <laughs> They're going to tie for the worst record with four other teams, and and either Winston or Mariota will not be available. You'll get the third pick. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And then you just have to pray somebody fails some sort of test before the draft <laughs> and drops a spot. Yeah. But and then on top of it, you might have Rivas versus Sanchez in the Super Bowl. I mean, that could I, happen, too. That could. But That'd I, be awkward. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. Aren't you friends with the Jets owner? No, I am not friends. Or you weren't friends. So you had some sort of, I, I can't remember the details. God forbid I researched this, but <laughs> you were got involved, or maybe you slammed the Jets a couple years ago. Is that it? Somehow you were in the news with the Jets. Well, you know, Eric Mangini and um, Mike Tannenbaum. Yes. Um, I, I knew those guys. Okay. In fact, when they were in L.A., once they came to my office... Uh, into the editing room and watched watched one of the shows before it aired. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and we talked and then I, I remember calling Tannenbaum before the, uh, before one of the drafts. That's what it was. Yeah. You called them before a yeah. draft to yeah. give your input. Yeah. To give my input. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you might have to do that again. Yeah, I, well, 
<laughs> but Woody Johnson, um, I've, I've met once. Mm. You, you should give your input right now, and your input should be lose these last three games. Yeah, I think they know that. I think, well, I don't know, because yeah. what the scary part is Rex probably leaving after the year. What does he care if they lose the last three games? He's not going to be able to coach that quarterback anyway. If I'm Rex, not. I'm trying to win these uh, last three games. Of course he is. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I'm blitzing Jake Locker or whoever the <laughs> right. Tennessee quarterback is every time. Exactly. That's, that's the problem. Mm. But what's weird about the Jets, first of all, you won a Super Bowl which a lot of these teams haven't. I mean, granted, it was the year, the eight months before I was born, yeah. but you have a Super Bowl. Right. But then, you know, 09, 2010, like the team made the championship game. You had a great win in Foxborough. It's not like it's been a catastrophe. We had, right, we had... Uh, Vinny in the championship game. We had the Super Bowl. We had a, we had uh, Ken O'Brien one game against Miami. I think yeah. there was a playoff game. Uh, this is it, by the way. That's the A.J. The, Dewey game. Yeah, since the Super Bowl. Yeah. yeah. You had that Ken O'Brien Miami game. Yep. And then you had the Testa Verde game. Which at halftime, I felt like you had a chance. Against Denver, right? Yeah, yes. in Denver. You had yes. a chance in that game. Yes, and then there was a... I might have even bet you at halftime and lost. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, well, I, would have, I wouldn't have bet on the Jets. But probably, yeah. that, that's why I lose when I bet. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there was definitely a chance that game. I like that team too. That Parcells Testa Verde team. That was a good team. It's a good team. And then you had, um, then you had nothing right until until Ryan. You did can that, make a did case. Did Edwards make a playoff game? I, I don't think so. Well, you beat the the Pats in Foxborough that year. I forget it was like 2010. Well, but that was Ryan. That's before Ryan. Right? Oh, that's before Ryan. Was that before? I, no, it was no, Ryan. That was You're Ryan. right. It was Ryan. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of blocked that game out of my mind because I'm a Pats fan. Oh, yeah. That was a tough one. Didn't see that one coming. We were like 10-point favorites, too. Believe me, I didn't see it coming either. Yeah. <clears throat> so then, you know, it's it's. I don't feel like they've been like the Raiders the last last 12 years. You no, know, they haven't been the, no, they haven't been the Raiders, no. But still, four good seasons in 40 years? Come on. Do you, like, have you interacted with Roger Goodell? <laughs> no, no. I've had none, no, no interaction. Do you care about this, all the stuff that happens with the league, or you just watch the games? I, I, I really don't care. Yeah, most people don't. I, I really have no I interest I probably shouldn't in care either. In fact, in fact, when I watch some of the shows and they start getting into it, I turn it off. Mm. Oh, so you watch the studio shows? I watch, I watch them when I work out, yeah. Really? Which yeah. ones do you watch? I watch, uh, I flip around. I flip around. I, I love That's great. Co I love Colin. Colin I, Coward. Colin Coward, yeah. Interesting. Oh, so you're like watching day after day. You're watching like the ESPN, yeah. like in the I mean, in my the first, my first uh, you PTI, know, all that stuff. PTI during lunch. Yeah. During lunch. Wow. Yeah. See, I, this is, I never know with celebrities because sometimes celebrities pretend they're a sports fan, but then as I talk to them, I'm like, oh, this guy's kind of faking it. Oh, no. I, I know. This seems like, yeah. oh, you're watching Colin. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. I watch strong. Colin and PTI when I'm having lunch. Um, NFL Live, maybe couple. No, no. Th those things. No, those things don't interest me because the game's about the game's going to start. It's all nonsense. It doesn't matter what they're saying. I know. You know. I. It's funny. I feel like I should watch the studio shows, and I never do because I always feel like it's just guys doing this and looking in the camera. And Mark Sanchez has to play better, yeah, and it's right. a lot of that stuff. Exactly. And I just, yeah. I'm just online trying to figure out, you know, who to start my fantasy team. Well, so, sometimes I want to I want to tune in just to see what they're going to say about the uh, the day before. Like if it's if it's if the Jets play on a Monday night, right? I'll definitely tune in on Tuesday morning to see what they're saying about the the team. Right? Do Jets other Jets fans come up to you to commiserate? They must once in a while. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, but it's not a. Uh, I'm I'm in LA most of the time, but. Oh, that's true. Probably not a lot of Jets fans around here. No. What do you think LA is a sports town? I don't quite have a handle on it. Me neither. <clears throat> you know, when I go to like a, um, when I go to Madison Square Garden for a Ranger game, I knew who those people were. I had a sense of where they might be from and what they did. And, hmm. and uh, when I go to a, like a Ranger game here at the Staples Center, I have no idea who's at that game. I don't know who those people are. Yeah, uh, they're all. It's all a mystery to me. Uh, I don't know where there's hockey in L.A., but they show up. Yeah. Um, 
Same thing, same thing with a, a, a Met game and a Yankee game. When I'm in the stands, I, I kind of have a sense of, of who's there. Also performing, too. Yeah. Like, like doing stand-up in New York. You know, you know who, who's in the audience. Oh, and here you don't? Here I don't know who they are. Yeah. I don't know where they're from or who they are. Yeah. When you, um, at some point in life, you, you started, you were at courtside for, for like Laker games and stuff like that. Was there some sort of tipping point where you realized you were all of a sudden a famous enough person that it totally made sense for you to be courtside at these games and a visible guy? No, the only reason I was courtside is because my, my friend and agent, Ari Emanuel, has those has those seats right. every now and then he would ask he would ask me if I would if I would go but you totally belong courtside oh I would know. argue oh, oh belong on courtside well it's just that you know they'll, they'll show the celebrities in the games and all of a sudden you were one of the celebrities they oh showed. Well, when I well um because I I I guess you spent years and years not thinking of yourself as well, the person they would show on TV is like, hey, Jack Nicholson's here yeah. and Larry David. <laughs> well, at the Staples Center, I, I only go when uh, if Ari invites me and I'll go with him. Mm. Um, because I, for the most part, unless the Knicks are playing, I don't really like going to games. How come? Because I, I need an, an, emotional, an emotional interest in it. I, I need to be rooting Right. And if I don't if I if I don't care, I'm not a Lakers fan. So I, I you know, it didn't matter to me if they won or lost. I have if I have no rooting interest, I'm I, there's no reason to be there really. That's interesting. Cuz sometimes I'll go and I just like I always find something in the game, but this is what I do for a living. Yeah. So I'll be like, oh, Lakers, Pelicans, I'm going to go watch Anthony Davis. And yeah. That's what I'll do for that game. Right. You know what I mean? Right, sure. But yeah, that, the rooting thing, I guess I never really thought about. Well, because yeah, most of the time I'm agnostic unless it's a Boston team. Yeah, I mean I know the difference in what it feels like to be rooting as opposed to not rooting. Right to studying. Yeah, You're ro- rooting yeah. or studying. Yeah, I don't really need to study. Yeah. How did the when you had a uh, you trip Shack that whole thing? Yeah. How did that idea happen? I was at one of those games, sitting in in sitting, the Ari seats, in, in, sitting in the Ari seats, right next to the right next to the Laker bench. And every time a player would report in and have to get it into the game, they would have to pass me. And I do, I, I'm a sloucher. Right. And I do, every time they got up, I had to move my feet in. Yeah. So, of course, I thought, well, that could be kind of funny if I tripped Shaq and injured him. You know. When you have an idea like that, do you, do you write it on a notepad? Do you email it to yourself? How does that work? I, I carry around a pad yeah. and uh, a pen. Um, and so I would write the idea down and then I transcribe it into a l- larger notebook. Right. So Robert Horry came within three feet of your feet. Yeah. And you're like, wow, what if I had tripped him? Yeah, exactly. Break out the book. Yeah. And then yeah. all of a sudden it's an episode. Yeah. And Shaq was very available, I guess. Shaq did it. Yeah. He likes, he, he's, he's available for yeah. acting roles. Right. It was probably his best acting role. It was he either was, that or Kazam. He was, I haven't seen any of his movies, but he was very good in, in this one. <laughs> he was. And then you had a Dodger Stadium, which one yeah, of Yeah, we did a Dodger Stadium. One of my favorite episodes. Yes. So you got, you Thank involved you. Dodger Stadium. Yeah. And, uh, I'm trying to think. Those, I guess, are the two landmarks. What else would you have in L.A. for sports? So that would be it, Staples Center and Dodger Stadium. Right, that's it. Unless you went to Carson for a soccer game. I don't, I don't know if that episode... No. <laughs> that's a, it's a cute field, though. I went to one game there. Are you anti-Laker fan or pro-Laker fan? Or, no, it's or funny. Or agnostic? Um, when they were great, I, I really didn't like them at all. I, I, they were arrogant, and um, I, just, I just didn't care for them. Now that they're fairly terrible, I'm I'm sort of watching them going. Oh, I, I wouldn't mind if they if they won the game. I, you know, it's oh, you missed the Laker flags. I'm what the Laker flags in the car. The last couple of years, you know, when they, the Lakers are winning, all of a sudden you drive around, you see all those flags in the back of the cars. Oh yeah, yeah, you yeah. Uh, I know, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They haven't seen them in a while, yeah. and there are no Clipper flags. Nobody's ever bought a Clipper flag. I don't think. Where do you stand in the Clippers? Like the Clippers. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I like them a lot. Um, um, 
I know Doc and um, you know Doc because you golf and he golfs. I bet yeah, that's how you know yeah, Doc. Yeah, right. So he, he's a great guy. So I'm rooting for him. So you are you? One, it seems like you're one of the go-to golf partners for people when they come out here. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't quite put it like that. Yeah, you're, <laughs> you're out. You're available. You have access well, to good courses, uh, and <laughs> somebody's out there like, yeah, I played golf with Larry David. <laughs> I'm not that available. You're available for golf. Not that available. You'll make yourself available. Not that no? available, no. I thought you loved golf. I thought you played I like do, three, but four I, times but a week. I play with a group. I only play twice a week on the weekends. I don't play during the week. Interesting. Yeah. Just weekends only. Yeah. Why don't you play during the week? I'm working during the week. So you don't even stand, no Tuesday, 3 p.m.? No. It's going to be daylight savings. It's 8.30. I'm going to sneak out? No. Nothing. Uh-uh. It's good discipline. Yeah. Well, also... Uh, it hurts my back if I play too much, so I, I try to I try to keep the rounds down to uh, twice a week. But I, I will occasionally get out for a Thursday or Friday round. Oh, the story's changed. The what? Your story's now. You now you are playing. I said week. occasionally. <laughs> what does that mean? Every now and then. I made as I told you. I made my comeback after a twenty year absence, and uh, I really never realized how much I missed the golf jokes. Oh, on the course? Yeah, just the really, yeah. really terrible golf jokes. Like, yeah. you, let, oh, you left it short. That's yeah. what she said. Like, all the, <laughs> oh, there's yes. a whole, there's yeah, a whole, yeah, whole yeah. network of terrible, terrible jokes terrible, that I missed. Yeah. Um, and then I remembered why I stopped playing, because I'll have five good holes, and then I'll just completely self-destruct. And it, then it, it becomes it, like I'm like Sanchez. Like, I can't get out of my own head for the next five holes. It's truly, it's truly unbelievable. There's nothing quite like it. No. No, there's not. And I, I caddied when I was a kid, so I feel like I have a pretty good grasp of just about everything. But, God, it's just it's just the worst. You have the rug pulled out under you, and you just don't expect it. You know what it is? Because when you're playing well, so if you hit a few good drives, now all of a sudden you're going to the tee thinking, oh, I hit that last one like 250. You yeah. Know? And now you're trying to hit – you're trying to match the last drive. Yeah. And whatever you did to hit that last drive, you weren't thinking that I'm trying to match the drive before. So playing well makes you play poorly because you're trying to match your other shots and you don't know what you did. Right. You know, <laughs> I was, you know, last weekend I was, I was playing great. And then all of a sudden I, I tried to match it and I couldn't. You- and then I really fell apart. It was it- awful. It's it's just the worst. Yeah. Do you have do you play with like do you have a set person you play with or a set group of people or do you bounce around? I I, pl- I play with a, a set group. There's like like five to eight of us. Yeah. Would you consider yourself fun to play with? No, because I'm not fun to no, play I'm with. No, I'm not. All. No. Yeah. In fact, uh, <laughs> somebody somebody once paid like a, a ridiculous amount of money to play with me for a oh, charity. No. Yeah. Oh, like a school auction or one of those things? Yeah, 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 an auction. But I mean, an insane amount of money to play around a golf with me, yeah. thinking that he was going to be, that this, oh, this is going to be fun. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, they really should have given him back that money. That was unfortunate because I'm not good company on the golf course. I'm, no. I'm intense and um, I'm focused. You know? Right. And I'm not, I'm just not all that charming. I don't want to, I, I, I couldn't. I, I, I couldn't talk to the guy. I totally understand that. And I'm the same. if I have one bad hole, I don't talk for like six holes. Yeah. I'm yeah. so moody. Some There's certain things that are like that. Like golf's like that. I think playing blackjack where people – like there's a couple other things where people just assume whatever your personality is is going to be your personality when they do that thing. But the reality is everybody has different personalities for – golf or whatever it is blackjack whatever like anything that where you have to concentrate it could go anyway yeah just because you're funny or personable or whatever that doesn't necessarily mean my friend daniel is probably my most fun friend he's horrible to play blackjack with like he'll get he'll immediately get up if he has one bad like vegas blackjack yeah like vegas like he'll just get up like you won't see him again and he he likes to just be alone but he's fun in every other part of his life and then takes it personally when you make fun of him for blackjack. Oh, so he doesn't want any company when he's playing no, blackjack. No, he, de- he doesn't want camaraderie. He doesn't believe he just in like wants a hot to focus table. on the cards. Yeah, he and, just, yeah. It's just him and the dealer. He doesn't want friends at a blackjack table. Yeah. I, which I don't understand. I'm the opposite. 
Yeah, I would want friends at the blackjack yeah. table. It's part. It's part of the whole thing. But I, I, I've kind of lost my interest in in gambling like that. I mean, I like playing poker with friends. Yeah, but I, I don't like going to Vegas and gambling there. You don't gamble on football. Um, I used to, but I've stopped. I can't remember. Has there been a gambling subplot in any Seinfeld or Cooper enthusiasm? Yeah, yeah. We had the Korean bookie. <laughs> what did he say? Oh, that's when um, Oscar. Yeah, hey, Oscar. Yeah, right, right. I forgot what I was gambling on. Oh, I think it was basketball. Yeah, I was gambling on basketball. We actually, I think, and Grantland, I think we we're going to have a Curb Your Enthusiasm week just to entice you to have a, one last season. We've actually talked about this in meetings. Is and that stuff. right? Yeah, because now it's like enough times passed that I don't totally remember, you know, anecdotes like that. Like, what's that? Like, it all kind of starts to blend together, and they yeah. don't really show the show that much anymore, which yeah. I guess they show it on the comedy channel. But... You know, the, I, I think the show and the characters and the different situations like meant a lot to pretty much everybody who likes laughing when they watch television. So, now, but now it's like enough. It's going to be 2015 in a month. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. And I, I'm reading between the lines. It doesn't sound like you're doing another season. Like I said, <laughs> I know, like you said, but the the point you I, made I was the, a really I guess good point. the odds would be would be against it. I guess right now the odds would be against it, probably six to one. Couldn't it maybe end with one last 90 minute? Actually, that wasn't even 90 minutes. It was like 80 minutes, 80 minute mockumentary that wraps it up. That could, well, that's a possibility. You know, I got so much grief from the Seinfeld finale, which a lot of people intensely disliked, that I, I'm, I no longer feel a need to wrap things up. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. So you're still mad about that. I, I wouldn't say I'm mad about it, but it taught me a, it taught me a lesson that if I ever did another show, I wasn't going to wrap it up. Right. And so, what's interesting is that was, I mean, the internet was around, but not in the form it's in now. Yeah. And now it's like any time a show ends, it has to turn into this three week referendum yeah. before and after the show. If exactly. They did it right, and yeah. if they didn't, people are so upset. upset. It's a free television show. Yeah. I think the thing about finales is that everybody writes their own finale in their head, whereas if they just tune in during the week to a normal show, they're surprised by what's going on. They haven't written it beforehand. They don't mm. know what the show is. Right. But, in, but if for a finale, they go, oh, well, this should happen to George, and then Jerry and Elaine should get together and all that. And so they've already written it, and, and often they're disappointed. Right. Because it's not what they wrote. What did you think was the most unfair criticism of the Seinfeld finale? I can't, I, I, I don't know, because I, I, I don't remember anything specifically. But you were mad about it. I know that people ha hated it. <laughs> yeah. I don't think people hated it. They were disappointed. A lot I, of people were disappointed. I, I, I would yeah. agree with that. I think, I, like, I, I think people just didn't like the fact that they wound up in jail, you know. Right. Maybe but that was it. I think as the years go by, it was... You know, you kind of think about it in the way all the different characters went in. I remember being disappointed when it happened, but now I, I like it more than I did when I watched it. So oh, that really? Sense. That's interesting. Well, it was, it was just, it kind of did wrap everything up. And yeah, if you, if, if you were going to do a season finale that wrapped up the show, that had to have been what it was going to be, where they kind of paid for their sins over the course of the nine seasons. Thank you, Bill. Right. Yeah. Thank you. But you remember. Finally. This, but we were, for season finales, we were coming off this run of shows that ended like how Cheers did, where it was basically like, you know, a, like a Viking funeral and, and Sam adjusting co dead coach's painting before he walked out. And that's what people's expectations were, that it was going to be this emotional ride and they were going to say goodbye to the characters. Yes, yes. An emotional ride. Yes. Right, exactly. You weren't, you weren't interested in not the emotional in, no, ride. No, I was not interested in an emotional ride and neither was Jerry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, no wonder why they would dislike it. Yeah. Well, I think the internet now would have been. But I mean, I have to say, I have, let me toot my own horn for a second. Yeah, please. Okay. 
I thought it was clever to bring back all those characters in a courtroom and testify against them yeah. for, for, for what they did. Right. And, and then show those clips and, and also for why they even got arrested in the first place. And, and then to wind up in, in uh, I, I don't like, uh, I forget the self-aggrandizement here. But, no, uh, I'm with you. Yeah, but I, I thought it was clever. I, I, the, one, the season finale that bothered me the most of any show or the series finale was Sopranos just because I thought my cable went out. Uh-huh. And that shouldn't be my reaction when a show ends. Like, <laughs> t- what? oh, my God, t- my cable went out. And then it took 10 <laughs> seconds to realize that it was just the, the long black. Like, if they had kept the HBO logo on the bottom, we would have known. Right. But when your TV goes black, you assume the cable went out. <laughs> and that, that was the one that got me. Yeah, those, out of all those of finales, man. Mm. Problem. But I'm glad to hear that you're coming around. I came around. I came around. It wasn't perhaps, even a coming around. Perhaps th- this will start a trend of some kind, a, a groundswell. How often do you see Seinfeld? The person or the show? The person. Um, you know, if I go to New York, I'll see him. Sometimes I'll see him out here. I thought it was really interesting after the show ended a couple years later, he did that comedian documentary about <clears throat> trying to get back into stand up. And I thought it was awesome. Like, I really thought it was an interesting window and kind of what do you do after you just climb the mountain, basically, and then you came down from the mountain, and then now it happens. Yeah. See, he did the documentary that I was going to do but instead made stuff up for. Right. right? He did the real one. He did the real one, yeah. Right. Um, All right, so your play is February. Yes. February 3rd? I don't know. What does it say in that little poster? I I had it written down. It's in February. And how long do you think this is going to go for? I know exactly how long it's going to go for. Okay, tell me. Until the middle of July. Middle of July? So you're in New York for five months. (laughs) More. Six. Six months. If not seven. What's yeah. the golf situation? Dire. <laughs> there, there is no golf situation. There's no situation. I, I'll probably be able to play when the weather gets warmer in April, maybe, on Mondays. Or I'll be able to play during the week, any day, really. The draft's not in New York this year. The NFL draft. Oh, it's yeah, in Chicago, Chicago. which why, is, I, I don't totally they know. Do they, I don't know. But I, I have all the drafts that I would have wanted to see in New York. I think this would have been my number one choice. Yeah. Especially if they had the third yeah. pick. It would have been unbelievable. What do you think of Mariota? I, I heard Mel Kuyper on the radio yesterday talking about this. What did he say? He's basically like somebody that the, they asked by, him. By the way, just let me interrupt for one second. Have you heard Frank? What, uh, Frank? Yeah, that's what I heard. Frank Kelly. What's his, he was doing Mel Kuyper is br- the third. Mel Kuyper is so goddamn funny. And I was listening I to Mel Kuyper the third yeah. and I thought it was Mel Kuyper. And I was like, <laughs> is he on drugs? What's going on here? That it was Kelly. Oh. But, um, but they were basically saying that Marietta, it's, it's a little hard to evaluate him because that offense and the receivers are always open. And, Whereas Jameis is kind of like the traditional, you could kind of project him. So nobody knows if Mariota is. Although, did did he not throw like a bullet, like a 50-yard bullet, the, the, his last game that I saw? That, and I was thought, oh, man. That, that the, here's the thing. There's no way to know with quarterbacks. No, exactly. We've never figured this out. Yeah. There's no like, oh, here's it. Like, it's just, it's case by case and it's totally random. Right. And there's no rhyme or reason to it. No rhyme or reason. Like, I remember the Patriots took Tony Eason over Dan Marino. And it made total sense. Dan yeah. Brito had all the tools. Well, the, I mean, Jets, I told well, you the Jets took Ken O'Brien. And you in took that Ken draft. O'Brien. Yeah. And it's like, Dan Brito, eh, a little too slow. It's like yeah. they've never figured this out. We almost took uh, Bledsoe over, or Rick Meyer over Bledsoe in 93. And Bledsoe wasn't a Hall of Famer, but he was a really good starter for 10 years. But that was like a debate. And Rick Meyer was out of the league in yeah. three years. I just think you go through all these guys and it. It's a real crapshoot, that quarterback position. Um, Last thing, we didn't talk Knicks, really. Okay. And they've been terrible for the whole century, too. Yeah. Um, and I would say it's even a little more hopeless. It's funny, but they keep becoming terrible in the same way. History keeps repeating itself with them. Um, you know, like when Thomas took over. Isaiah. Yeah. Right. What, who he brought in. The draft picks that he gave up. And they never learned their lesson from that. And they made the same mistake again. 
the Carmelo trade. Yeah. Give up a bunch of assets. I, exactly. Exactly. Well, I would say the one constant there would be the owner. <laughs> I suppose so. Yeah. That's the thing is like, I'm actually writing a piece about Daniel Snyder right now, the the Washington professional football team owner. And uh, like he, they've changed the coach eight times. They've had 16 starting quarterbacks, but they've had one owner. <laughs> and if you have a bad owner, it's really hard to, I just watched it with the Clippers over these last 30 years. Like Sterling was a disaster. He was a terrible owner. He was the worst owner in any sport. And it's hard to, it's hard to bounce back from that. You really need you need to win multiple lotteries and you need to just luck out with players. Are you not shocked as to how long Elgin Baylor held his job <laughs> given that team's record? I mean, he was probably GM longer than anybody. He was. In the history of the game, maybe. It, well, and he was cost effective. <laughs> I think he was making like one third as much money as the other GMs. I think that's why Sterling did re, did things like that for it was like purely financial. I was like, well, if I have him, he's not going to ask me for a raise. They hired Vinny Donegro one year because the Bulls were paying half of his contract. Dolan's got an, Dolan's got a different problem. Like he spends money. It doesn't yeah. seem like he cares. It's just well, no, he does care. And let's see what happens with this um, with Phil. They might be screwed with this Carmelo thing, though. They might be. I fear they are. I actually, I, I wrote a huge column defending him in like July. You did? That he, I thought he could be the best player to win. I thought he could be the best player on the right team that could compete for a title and win it. I have a feeling he would have been incredible on the Bulls. He would have. You know? That's that, a great fork in the road moment. Right. That's where he belonged. Right. Not, not this team. And he took the money. What's funny is. He did. There was this huge ESP in the magazine. Who can, who can blame him, really? Well, but there was this huge ESP in the magazine cover story about uh, how he's a businessman now. And it was like pictures of him in his office. And he's oh, like, really? I want to be remembered for more than basketball. I was saying all this stuff. It's like, you haven't made the finals yet. But um, but it's this whole thing about business. But if he was a good businessman, he would have taken a two-year out, gone to Chicago, tried to win a title. And then in 2016, the cap goes crazy. And he could have been making $35 million a year. And it's like... Right, we, you're right. Actually, you're actually yeah. not a good businessman. Yeah. You left all this money on the table yeah. and That's picked true. the wrong team. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. That's true. How about Steve Kerr's move, though? How about that? Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, he was like, he was going to sign with the Knicks. Yeah. He was like 90% there. And now he's stumbled into, uh, they have the most talented team, probably. I watched them last night. I think they have a chance. So do I. Do you know him? Who? Steve Kerr. No, he was, he was very beholden to Phil Jackson. Like that was like his most important mentor mm -hmm. and he was going to take that job because he loved Phil Jackson and then just something was holding him back. And then finally, I, but, I really don't think their record would be any different if he was coaching the Knicks. I don't think so. No, it's a terrible team. It's a terrible basketball. Just team. terrible. All right. So your play fish in the dark premieres in February on Broadway. Yeah. And six to one odds on Kirby enthusiasm coming back. I'll make it eight. Make it eight to one. <laughs> eight, to one. eight to one. Oh my god. Yeah. It changed. But um there's some terrific people in the play too. Oh, wanna to mention them quick? Uh, Rita Wilson. She's playing my wife. And uh, Ben Shankman is in it. Um Jane Howdy Shell. Um some really good people. You didn't fire David Schwimmer two weeks into it, did you? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Fish in the Dark, February, Broadway. And Louis Stadler. Louis Stadler. Yeah. Okay. Good luck. This is exciting. Thank you. I might have to see it if I'm if I'm passing through the Big Apple. That's yep. Like. No. Yeah. Come and see it and have some uh, plausible deniability. Don't tell me you're coming. This way, if it stinks, you'll never have. You can just say, and you never saw it. That's a good game plan. Did yeah. you ever come to the play? No, yeah, never made it. Exactly. But then if I liked it, I'll know you'll remember the compliment for the rest of your life. Well, if you like it, then then you'll you'll tell me. Yeah. <laughs> Larry David, thank you. Good luck with the Jets. I hope you lose this weekend. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, I hope so too. Before I get the sign off. 
Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. Hey, what you got there, Golic? The new Subway Chipotle chicken melt with guacamole. Man, that looks good. Yeah, this new guac is really bringing the flavor. Got one for me, too, right? Well, yes and no. Uh, mostly no. Well, really, all no. Oy. Try the irresistible new Subway Chipotle chicken melt with guacamole, juicy grilled chicken strips with Monterey cheddar, Chipotle Southwest sauce, and new guacamole made from ripe Haas avocados with just a hint of jalapeno. Subway, eat fresh.